Thank you so much to all of you for joining, spending your valuable time, your screen time with us. I hope you've enjoyed these island journeys. And today we're going to wrap up our series by talking about what happens next? What happens after these incredible heroic eradication projects are completed, the islands are primed to return to their you know, vibrant, thriving, uh, historic um, levels. Well, what happens? How do we do that? And so we have some really qualified uh, staff here to tell you all about that process. So today is gonna be about um, social attraction and we have called, called it broadcasting for birds because as you will hear, actual bird broadcasts happening. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna um, mute everyone and then the speaker can unmute themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute all and then we're going to start. Thank you. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Steve Kress and it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today because I have spent a lifetime on this very topic of social attraction. I came to Audubon nearly 50 years ago, and I directed Audubon's National Audubon Society's Seabird Restoration Program, the founder of that program, also known as Project Puffin. So I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, what I discovered along the way um, as I began trying to attract puffins, Atlantic puffins, back to a historic island along the main coast, because this was the first time somebody had tried to start a colony of seabirds. And little was known about it, and there was lots of doubt about it. But seabird puffins are typical of other seabirds being social birds. And I discovered along the way that uh, they can be attracted by putting out decoys. Of course, hunters have known that for a long time, but this was the first time decoys were used for conservation. And I was happy to be able to demonstrate how puffins were uh, attracted first to eastern egg rock uh, using uh, translocation. And later, uh, I was able to show that by putting little puffin chicks in burrows, they would come home. Um, they would grow up on the island, but they wouldn't necessarily um, land on the island. Trying to advance this a little bit more here. Okay, so this is a puffin chick, and this is what they look like when they are just a, at the age we moved them from Newfoundland. Uh, we discovered we could hand rear them fine, but after releasing them for years and them going off to sea and not coming back, I tried to think like a puffin, and that's what led me to putting up decoys because puffins usually come back to existing colonies. As soon as I put up puffin decoys, uh, the translocated puffins identified by leg bands started landing. And with that, we had our first spark of being able to prove that decoys were important for attracting seabirds back to historic sites. The translocation was one step, but the decoys uh, really brought this home. It took another four years. It was eight years from the time we started before puffins finally started bringing fish back which was the clue that they had chicks. So after a hundred years, puffins started nesting again on Eastern egg rock. And in so doing, it was a great success for this project. I had no idea how this idea was important beyond puffins, but it soon became to be apparent as we started testing the same decoy method to attract Arctic terns, a surface nesting seabird. Uh, we used uh, wooden decoys hand painted these, uh, adapting the method somewhat for turns by putting out uh, audio recordings. This made it possible to make it sound like an active colony. We've since realized that sound is just as important, maybe more so than decoys for starting seabird colonies. And when you put out the decoys and when you put out the sound together, the turns behave amazing around the decoys, sometimes offering food to them, sometimes trying to chase the decoys away. But ultimately, every time we've done this, uh, the turns have laid eggs near the decoys. When this happened, I began to finally get it that we were touching on something fundamentally new 
fundamentally important because for the first time, people were able to start seabird colonies rather than destroy them. And that was a novel idea. At the time, most people thought you just sort of let nature run its course, but I felt otherwise. People had wiped off these birds from the planet and from the islands. Why not try to bring them back? Here's Sue Shubel, who now heads up our uh, decoy production uh, facility in Bremen, Maine. And now she makes decoys and we've modified our mirror boxes. These are now shipped to seabird managers around the world from uh, Bremen, Maine. Uh, a few of the places that these have worked, some of the first places, the first project in the Pacific was on Devil's Slide Rock, a little sea stack south of San Francisco where an oil spill had wiped the birds out in um, 1982. Now it's restored using decoys. Another important project using decoys is Torishima Island for the short-tailed albatrosses. Here, Hiroshi Hasegawa has put out life-size decoys and sound recording systems. And others have moved the albatross chicks off of Torishima, which is an active volcano, starting new short-tailed albatross projects. This has led to other albatross projects. Our newest project that we've been working with um, directly is the project of tiny crested terns. And here you can see a extremely endangered tiny crested terns and its mate interacting with decoys and hidden dow at the historic turn nesting island off the coast of China. That project has resulted in, in at least three new colonies of Chinese crested terns, a species thought to be extinct for about 70 years is now nesting there in part because of uh, social attraction. So we're very pleased with how these methods are now being used worldwide. A database project is now looking at seabird restoration projects using decoys uh, around the world. And these are some of the sites, including two uh, that you're gonna hear more about in this project. So it's, it's very satisfying to me to have partners like Island Conservation that are carrying this work forward at new sites, giving the birds a boost. It's one thing to remove the predators that cause them to disappear, but with these methods, we can actually encourage them to breed in safe habitat. I'm pleased that Maria uh, will now tell us about her project. Maria came to Maine and worked with us and, and I'm thrilled that she's now uh, doing her own project. Hi everyone, thank you Steve for that amazing presentation. Um, so my name is Maria Jose Vilches. I am a Chilean veterinary. I am island restoration specialist for island conservation since uh, 2017. And today I have the honor of being one of your tour guides and share with you a project we are carrying out in China Island located in the Humboldt Penguin National Reserve. So if you are ready to get started, um, the first thing is to get to Chile, go to the Atacama region and travel to Chañaral de Aceituno Cove. Once in the Cove, we must put our life jacket, clean our shoes. We don't want exotic seeds on the island. Make sure you have everything you need. A good snack is always a good idea and just get on the boat. So first, let me introduce you the Peruvian diving petrel, also known as Junco, remember this name. If you look at the sea, you can see, you can recognize uh, them for being excellent divers and for being a little bit clumsy when they want to take off from the sea. Um, this bird is uh, classified as endangered and is an endemic seaver of the Humboldt Current. And in this travel to Chenal Island, the Yunco will be the star. And I will show you the first social attraction project carried out for this species, but also the first for Chile. Um, so we, uh, while we keep, we, we keep sailing through the Pacific Ocean, 
And as the boat moves away from the coast, we can see the three islands that make up the Humboldt Penguin National Reserve, Chañaral, Toros, and Damas. Why do you think the reserve received its name? 80% of the world population of the Humboldt Penguins lives on this in these islands. And I can assure you um, that we are going to see some of these seabirds on this journal. As we go to Chineral, let me share some information regarding Choros Island. Don't get too excited, we are heading to Chineral, but since we are already here, it's good to know the whole story. Island Conservation, together with CONAF, the Chilean National Forestry Corporation, which is the agency uh, that manages Chile's protected wild areas, removed the invasive rabbit from Choros Island in 2014. The European rabbits affected the vegetation, but also the Yunkos population. But after removing this invasive mammal, the Yunkos colonies that inhabit Turtles Island have been growing and the vegetation has been recovering. This is how the island looked before and after the rabbit removal. So why, why, why are we uh, talking about Turtles Island? Here is an interesting fact. There is a higher percentage of seabird recolonization in those islands that have a source population within the nearest 25 kilometers. Choros and Chañaral are separated by only uh, 16 kilometers, and we can find the 95% of the Yunkos Chilean population nesting here in Choros. So in Choros is where we have our source population which increased the chances of a successful colony restoration on Chenal Island. So if we are convincing some Yunkos on this borough to accompany us to Chenal Island. But let's continue our journey to Chenal. So people from all over the world travel to this site to see dolphins, seabirds, and whales. And this is our lucky day a humpback whale with her baby uh, will accompany our trip to the island. So what is interesting about this island, about Chañaral Island? Uh, this island one hosted the world's largest Junkos breeding colony with an estimate of 100,000 breeding pairs. But this population was extirpated uh, from the island by the pressure of invasive mammal. So in 2016, CONAF, in collaboration with Island Conservation, initiates a project to remove the European rabbit from Chañal Island. In 2017, the island and the entire reserve were declared free of invasive mammal. And now Chañal is a better place for the Yungus recolonization. This unique desert island is home of a great variety of terrestrial and marine fauna and of native plant species many of them treated. You're probably thinking, it doesn't seem like an island with a lot of vegetation. The truth is that the plants remain silent, waiting for a rainy season that will allow them to bloom and show some fragile, so fragile flowers that bring colors to the landscape of this island. But these last only a few weeks, then we have to wait for another rainy season. After 40 minutes in the boat, we have already reached Chañaral Island. Almost always when we arrive there is a curious sea otter who watches us disembark. And of course, sea lions resting in the surroundings. We, oh, <laughs> okay. So now I need you join forces. Can you see this, the steep path on the top? We must carry our bags and equipment up there and beyond. But I promise you, I, it will be worth it. With our camp installed, we can begin our walk to the southeast of the island, where we currently have installed our social attraction tools. In, 19, in 2019, uh, with the support of the American Beer Conservancy, and the David and Lucy Parker Foundation, Island Conservation, CONAF, and the Catholic del Norte University create a plan based on the success of different seabirds colonies restoration projects. 
And after generate our strategy in September 2019, before the peak of the Yungos reproductive season, the team returned to Tenyal Island to determine the most suitable sites to implement the social attraction tools for the Yungos. The objective was to create the best Yungos neighborhood. So we chose two sites and each one we installed speakers, solar panels, batteries, and an MP3 player with a loop recording of vocalization of Yungos. This recording was provided by Conservation Metrics and it was obtained from the Yungos colony that lives in Shots. The Yungos during the days, during the day are in the sea, diving and looking for food. When the sunset begins, they return to their colonies and burrows uh, on Toros. And many of them fly really, really close from Chanyaral Island. And this is the moment where we need to capture their attention. This is the reason why we don't use the decoys. They will not see it during the day because they are in the sea. This is all, also the reason why the sound systems were configured to activate dusk and remain active until dawn. So it is working throughout the night in an uninterrupted, emitting this Yungo vocaliz vocalization over and over. It is like being on a pond full of frogs, but no, just juncos. We also installed 31 artificial nests made of PVC pipes and three uh, motion detection cameras, oh, I'm sorry, uh, were installed at each site to detect and monitor the arrival of the juncos. And this is the exciting part. In October, a month after we installed the sound system, Conaf visited the island, monitored the sites and social attraction tools, and found Yungo's footprints, small diggings, and motion detection cameras captured photos of Yungo's, up to three exploring at the same time. Some systems were installed one night um, before the, the motion detection cameras recorded the first Yungo's probably juveniles exploring this new bustling artificial colony that had settled on Tenyaral Island. So why are we happy about this? Why, why is it important to get the yungos back to the island? Yungos are considered a keystone species providing a vital ecosystem service by removing soil, soil when they build uh, their burrows and introducing nutrients to marine and terrestrial ecosystem through Wano. Um, to, recovery, to, to recovery of the colony will not only the recovery, I'm sorry, the recovery of the colony uh, will not only contribute to the restoration of the island, but will also provide the fishing communities of Chenal Aceituno, the cup where we start today our trip, opportunities to develop uh, sustainable ecotourism focuses on the appreciation and enjoyment of the marine and terrestrial ecosystem of the reserve. So can you see these brown spots? Okay, so this is how the Yungos colonies looks like in Toros, but this is what we want for Tanyaral. And yes, the Yunko are already exploring the island. However, today rain session on Tanyaral has not been confirmed and it may take a few years before the Yunkos begin to next successful in general, but we keep the dream alive and we look forward to witnessing the restoration of these colonies. So we are reaching the end of our trip to Tenyal Island. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I hope you have enjoyed it, but it's time to go for our life jackets and get back, back on our boat and maybe on a plane because the CTO is waiting for us. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Jose.
for that amazing journey through one of Sheila's treasures. Hello, dear passengers, and welcome to the Caribbean, where another epic journey awaits. My name is Cielo Figuerola, and I'm an island restoration specialist with Island Conservation in Puerto Rico. I'm a biologist, and for over 10 years, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world to work with incredible species, always learning and appreciating the amazing natural world that surrounds us. That is why I want to take you all with me on this journey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Something happened with the slides. Let me try to go back. Now we're there. That is why I want to take you all with me on this journey. Moving from South America to the Caribbean, 21 kilometers from the western coast of Puerto Rico, there lies a little rocky green dot in the middle of the ocean, one of Puerto Rico's best kept secrets, the island of Desacheo. Desacheo is a small island, only 122 hectares, but don't let its small size fool you because it's a tough island full of surprises. The island has very steep mountains and valleys and a very rocky coastline. Its maximum elevation is 213 meters, but going up these mountains feels like they are at a 90 degree angle and that's how steep they are. It is no wonder why the indigenous people called it Siqueo, which in their language means high land. This national wildlife refuge has vegetation typical of a subtropical dry forest, meaning there are many cacti, spiny shrubs, and small trees, but also that during part of the year, it is very dry with an average of 1,000 millimeters of rain per year. Invasive species used to inhabit the island, causing negative impacts to the native plant and animal species that made the Sacheo their home, and dramatically changing the habitat with their presence. Fortunately, these invasive species were removed as part of a restoration project to turn the Sacheo into the natural paradise it once was, and now native animal and plants can thrive again for the first time in over 100 years. Native species that inhabit the Sacheo, but there are a couple that are found nowhere else in the world. Like, for example, the Desacheo ground lizard, a lizard that is mostly active during midday and feeds on insects and larvae. The Desacheo anole lizard, which is only an old lizard present on the island. And the Desacheo dwarf gecko, one of the smallest reptiles in Puerto Rico. There are also threatened species like the Iguana cactus with large flowers that turn into round yellow fruits. But I haven't mentioned the most significant inhabitants on the Sacheo yet, the seabirds. The Sacheo used to have the largest brown booby colony in the Caribbean and one of the largest in the world. There were so many brown boobies flying that fishermen used to say the skies turned black. There were thousands of them. In addition to brown boobies, there were also tons of equated boobies, magnificent frigate birds, and several tern species like bridal terns and brown nutties. All in all, it was a seabird haven. Sadly, because of the invasive species, those black clouds of seabirds disappeared, but now that the island is restored, we are ready to help them come back. That is why in 2018, a group of collaborators joined the efforts and decided to start a social attraction project focused on three seabird species the brown knotty, the bridal tern, and the Audubon Sierra water. The brown knotty and the bridal tern were known to have large nesting colonies on the Sacheo in the 1920s. So we wanted to start attracting these species first because number one, it is known that terns respond well to social attraction tools. And number two, once established, they tend to attract other seabird species, which would help with the whole seabird restoration efforts. Our third species, the Audubon your water had never been documented on the Sacheo before we started the project, but we had seen these chair waters flying in the waters adjacent to the Sacheo, and there are records of them nesting in nearby islands. So because the Sacheo has ideal nesting habitat in between all the rocky crevices on the coast, 
and because the species is vulnerable in the Caribbean with very few nesting locations, we wanted to provide the species with suitable nesting habitat on the island. So after a lot of planning, we were ready to go to the Sacheo to start and establish the social attraction project. We were a team of six and we were going to camp on the island for 10 days. I should mention there is no human development on the island. It is a completely natural paradise or so it seems. That meant we had to take all our water, our food, all equipment and supplies because once we got there, what we had was what it was. To get to the island, we had to take a boat trip that takes almost two hours. Once there, to access the shore, we had to get in a dinghy boat to get close to the rocks in the coast and then jump on those rocks with all the equipment. All of this in between big waves and unforgettable spectacle that depending on the size of the waves, it can get your heart racing. Once on island, as you can see in the photo, we had to carry the heavy equipment up a hill, which can take almost a day. To what would become our camping site or our home away from home, basically an open area in the middle of the forest. I think camping on the Sacheo is similar to a hate-love relationship. On the I love you side, the Sacheo is such a unique, beautiful place. There's the silence of nature, the beautiful sky at night. There's also lifelong friendships. The amazing and you're away from it all, and that is priceless. However, I have to say that on the I hate you side, there are the cactus pines, the unbearable heat, all those steep mountains, and the fact that everything is falling because there are basically no flat areas. So you sleep rolling down inside your tent and having dinner becomes a game where you win by keeping your plate on the table without falling on the ground and rolling down him. But I have to say that the combination of all those things makes camping and living as a chill something you'll never forget. And we're so grateful to have had the privilege to do so. But we are here to establish our cyber social attraction devices. So I'll leave you with my colleague, Jose Luis, who will talk about the next part of this adventure. Thank you, Jose. Thanks, Cielo, and greetings, dear passengers. I hope, I hope you are enjoying this journey so far. My name is Jose Luis Herrera, project manager for Island Conservation, and I am speaking from the island of Puerto Rico. I cannot be more pleased to continue this journey because the Sacheo was the island where I did start working with the organization in 2009, and where I did start learning the fundamentals of the, social, of the island restoration work. So please keep, rela keep relaxing and enjoying the rest of the trip with me. Trying to advance in the next slide. Here we go. After the camping was set up, we did start the walk to the sites where the social attraction devices were planned to be established. We utilized three active social attraction techniques, and I will start introducing you one of these, which is the sound system. The sound systems were manufactured by the National Audubon Society and consisted of two outdoor speakers, four solar panels, two deep cycle marine batteries and a MP3 player or iPod as part of the more made music box as it's called and, and you guys can see in the, in the photos. In total, the team carried by work six marine batteries each with a weight of 90 pounds, 12 solar panels, six speakers and three more made music boxes to three different sites of the island. The team began the setup of the sound system, putting all the pieces together, wiring everything, solar panels, batteries, and the music boxes in order to get at least one or two systems ready in one day. Once the solar panels and the more made music boxes were installed, the team continued with the two speakers wiring and doing the installation. 
Each speaker was placed approximately 20 meters apart from each other. In each speaker, we deploy one motion sensing camera to monitoring activity during the three to four months of the breeding season on the Seychelles. Here is a happy team with one of the three sound systems installed in the west coast of the Seychelles, two systems to attract Audubonshi waters and one to attract brown nodies. The system for the Audubonshi waters were programmed to play only during the night for 12 hours, and the system for the brown nodies was programmed to play only during the day for 12 hours as well. So now we'll play a video that I took the past Saturday for you all to show the sound system how it looked like. Hello, dear passengers. Greetings from the Secheo Island, Puerto Rico. This is one of our sound systems deployed here for the out of onshore water. Here are these four solar panels. And in the back, you will see the Mermaid music box at the top and the box with the two Maringel batteries uh, in the bottom. And to show you what is inside the Mermaid music box is, as I mentioned before, two boxes with all the systems connected. And here is the iPad basically playing the calls for the other bunch of water during the night. And now you will hear how the night disco party sounds like for the other bunch of water. Believe me, this is very loud, uh, but nice, but at the same time annoying. The first night uh, playing after install all the system, basically we have to reduce the volume of the of the speakers because it was impossible to sleep uh, during, in our campsite. And, uh, but yeah, it's super, super loud. So the second and third social attraction techniques uh, utilized on the Seychelles were the decoys and the mirrors to attract bright lanterns and brown notice. The decoys are made of recycled high density polyethylene. They were also get from the National Audubon Society and they came already painted with the species colors as you see in the photos. The photo to the right show how the decoys were filled carefully with sand through a drill hole in their beauty bellies to give them weight and stability when we're deployed. The reflected mirrors have a triangle shape with three mirrors in each side fitted with screws and, and two plastic pieces at the top and at the bottom. The reflected mirrors enhance social attraction and for diurnal seabirds. Mirrors also help to hold the attention of pioneer individuals at the early stages of colonization, so they are more likely to meet others of their species. Here's the result of two days of field work, establishing three decoy colonies on the Seychelles in 2018. In total, we did start the project with three, south, three sound systems, 48 decoys, eight mirrors, and 10 motion sensing cameras. And of course, with a lot of hope and positive vibe about the further project outcomes. Now I'll show you two more short videos of the decoy colony for your better reference. Hello again, dear passengers. Here is one of our decoy colonies for the Bradley turn. As you see, all the decoys will play some in front of the mirrors. And some of them has motion sensing cameras pointing out to monitoring activity. Here is our boat waiting for us. Here's basically how it, does, it looks like. All them facing the ocean. Hello, dear passengers. It's me again. Here I am now in one of the decoy colonies for the brown nodding. You can hear in the background the call from the mermaid music boxes. 
I'm here approaching a group of decoy colony with a mirror. Moving ahead, seeing more ground notice decoys sitting on the ground and the call in the background through the outdoor speakers. Right. I will talk a little bit about the result we have reached so far. And I must start saying that to get the desired outcomes in a social, at social attraction project will take several years, as Steve just mentioned, or in some cases, maybe just a few years. In our case, we did start seeing some positive outcomes since the first year of the project. For the turns, in 2018, we deployed 30 decoys, five mirrors, and four cameras. But due to a large storm surge that hit the Secheo, unfortunately, we lost 29 decoys and all the mirrors plus the cameras. Yes, it's, it was super disappointing and also frustrating after all the hard work the team did to deploy them. But the good news is that one decoy survived. And this is the decoy that you are seeing here. This lonely decoy did the work and was able to attract individuals of its species to the site, as you see here and here. Another interesting fact is that each photo was taken in different months, starting in June and ending in August, which means that during the whole season in 2018, the lonely decoy was attracting live individuals of its same species to the site. Another positive outcome is that when we were able to visit the island in June 2018, we documented two nests of bright lanterns, each with an egg, and nearby, where, nearby to where the decoy colony was placed or where the decoy survived. A third nest was observed in a cliff, but the presence of an egg was not confirmed. As for the brown notice, in the first two years of the project, there has been no records of nesting or perching in the nearby areas where the decoy colonies were located. However, during visits to the island, we observed one brown notice flying near the decoy colonies and up to three individuals flying around the island, demonstrating that they are maybe using the island for some reason in places that we don't know yet, but we hope to know soon. As for the sound system, we also in less than a year did start having positive outcomes for the Audubonshi water. As you can see in the second photo from the left to the right, we were able to attract and detect one Audubonshi water that regularly was roosting on top of one of the speakers between April and June in 2018. This finding represents the first record ever for this species perching on the island, which is pretty, pretty amazing outcome. The photo to the extreme right was taken in 2019, where, the, where we documented in June two individuals visiting the same speaker, showing either an attempted copulation or an aggressive interaction to be defined later with the years. With these early results, we confirmed that the sound system is doing the work and we keep the hope alive that maybe one day we will document the first nest ever of this species on the island. During seabird surveys across the island in the last two years, we were able to document nests, eggs, chicks, and other individuals of ground and seabirds. With these findings, we have a hope of recovery for the ground and seabird species, as well as for the island ecosystem in general. How much it will take? Definitely more years, but maintaining the island free of threats, such as invasive species, will help in its recovery. More things are on the way for the Secheo, and the institutions and agencies working on the island and managing the island share the same goal, which is to continue the recovery efforts of thousands of nesting birds, native plants, and lizard species. With the removal of invasive mammals and the use of social attraction devices, the expectation is to see a growth of native and endemic species, and especially see the island full of seabirds nesting and providing quality and richness to the terrestrial and marine ecosystems as in the past. 
Well, my dear passengers, with this information, we have finalized our journey to SHO Island. So please, let's walk back to the shore because our boat is waiting for us. Please don't forget your life jacket and get prepared for a suitable boat ride back to Puerto Rico mainland. Lastly, the social attraction teams wants to thank all of you for your attention, good behavior, and interest on this journey around Chañaral and the Sacheo Islands in Chile and Puerto Rico. For us, it was a journey full of good memories, stories, and cool adventures, and we hope that you have enjoyed like us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, you can unmute yourselves uh, if you'd like to participate in the Q&A. Thank you so much to all our wonderful presenters. I certainly felt like I was there from the very beginning with those puffins in Maine to the uh, seabird eggs and desiceo at the end. So thank you, everyone. Um, we actually have some uh, great questions to start with. Um, there's a question ab about the decoys, whether there is a trade-off between having decoys that look good enough to attract the, the species, but don't look so, so good that they distract individuals from mating or settling in. Is there a, a trade-off between that or a certain quality of, of um, decoy you want to have to obtain maximum results? Um, I, could, I could try uh, to give an answer to that. Uh, I think it's a really interesting one. Um, we have experimented with some, what I call essence of uh, essence of turn decoys, where we took turns and just gonna uh, reduce them to just the minimum amount of features. Uh, but, and, and actually um, turns did respond to them. So I, I think that the, my hunch is that the decoys don't have to be all that detailed to get the, the effect, because really what a decoy is doing it's attracting birds to a site, encouraging them to land, giving them comfort to sit and stay. And there they meet others of real birds of their kind. And it's the other real birds that become the decoys moving forward. And so once you, it's sort of like starting a fire, a little spark first, and then the spark builds with a little kindling and then get more and more and more. And the, it's the additional real birds more than the decoys that makes the difference. But we do like the decoys to look as good as they can. After all, um, why not? <laughs> and I think there's a sec the other part of the question was whether um, whether the decoy can actually ever deter birds if they feel territorial or yeah waste aggressive behavior on them or try to try to mate with them and sort of waste their their resources uh, on interacting with the decoys themselves. So I I, th I do think that the the birds are very smart. We. Too often we underestimate the intelligence of the birds. They they figured out pretty quick these are not the real deal, and they learn this. Then they then they find comfort in sitting with them, but they're not really overly fooled. And that's that helps to explain why we often find eggs just inches away from a decoy. It gives them comfort, but not too much uh, concern. I love this. We have a new appreciation for the emotional life of birds. I see them in a whole different way now. Oh. Um, one question, how do, you, how do um, we decide where to create the decoy colonies for the different species? Yeah, I can try to that one. So basically we did uh, an historic mapping of the location for the seven breeding species for on the Sacheo. And uh, so in advance, we knew where they were in the past. So with that information, basically we decide what areas will be more suitable to deploy the colonies and deploy as well the, the sound system. But in this case for the out of bunch water, we didn't have any information about the species. So basically we, we were driving more for the habitat use and the habitat presence for, of the species in other islands in the Caribbean. So that's why we decide to select those two sites. Yeah, so I can I can say something about that too. Um, at least in Chenal, what we did was was to yeah to understand the the historic uh, sites that um, that we have from Chenal, but we also looked at the colonies on Choros and see why they why they like they they need sand soil, they need or not vegetations, what happened with the 
uh, flat or with the slopes. So you need to understand uh, what the other colonies uh, needs to have uh, their burrows or their nests and try to do your best to have some something similar or yeah, something something similar in the place where you want to do your social attraction, attraction project. We have another question, Cote, that I think is to you and maybe Steve or others would have in, input. Um, are the populations on the home islands or, you know, source islands limited by not enough sites to nest so that having additional nesting sites on adjacent islands enhances the overall population? For example, the Chile, Chile islands. Oh, so. I think the question is, um, is there a restriction on the, you know, in the, the source population on Charles, for instance, is there some sort of restriction on their nesting that would encourage them to go to the other site? Or, you know, do you create more nests overall by having a colony expand to another island? Or is it just kind of the net amount of nests over two islands? Like how, how do the two populations relate to each other, I think is the heart of the question and, and the drivers yeah. that force them to decide to go to one or the other. Yeah, so what what we expect is that uh, not just uh, all the colony from turtles came to Chinal. We are just expecting that uh, the maybe juveniles uh, came to the island because mm. the other ones that are already in turtles, they, they are going to nest there all the years. They are going to came uh, yen year by year, and and we hope that the more young others from turtles say, okay, so where is this? Here's a colony and they have never nesting uh, before. They have, this is, uh, we expect for the first uh, reproductive season of them to, they can decide, okay, maybe Tanya is a good place to have our nest, let's see. And um, so we are not um, making an impact in the source population because we are just trying to invite to uh, the more juveniles, uh, individuals to the island and I'm, I know I can remember if I told you but we have a population in Charles uh, that is growing uh, since uh, 2010 so uh, we hope that we can have some of that jingles in channel and we are going to have a good result. I might just add a little bit to that um, I think Maria explained it very well where the where, these projects are not trying to take breeding birds off of a well-established colony because they're very loyal to their island and to their burrows. They won't, mm. they won't the adults won't move. It's these young birds, the, what they're called prospectors that are, we're hoping to attract to projects like this with the hinkles. The, um, and most of the, the birds are very uh, loyal to their nesting site, but some of them will visit other islands and during their pre-breeding years. They probably don't breed till they're five or six years old. So in the mm. years leading up to that, they're exploring the areas. And it's then that we hope to attract them using the, the playback to encourage them to land and to discover these new sites. Great, thank you. Oh, a bunch of great questions here. If anyone wants to pitch us in on chat, but I'll read another question from um, the, um, if anyone wants to ask a question live, sorry, they can, but I'll read another one from chat. Um, would there be any advantage to using robotic decoys with movement and sound? Steve, I think we're looking to you on that. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll answer that. <laughs> uh, we've, we've experimented a bit with robotics actually. Uh, but getting back to my earlier comment about not really needing the, uh, the mechanics, they don't need to be too lifelike. And in fact, also what I said before about birds being smart, they would recognize that the robots are not the real thing. Uh, plus robots are just things that go, can break in these remote sites. Uh, I've always wanted to try to keep it simple. Uh, there's enough things that can go wrong. Uh, and so a nice solid, a non-moving decoy, particularly these rugged ones that, that Audubon is making now out of recycled polyethylene, they really last with no breaking parts. So I think keep it simple. The, the mirrors would actually was a, an idea to try to get motion. 
um, mm. try to have the birds become their own decoys, their own movement. And we've discovered that these mirrors can be highly attractive. Birds will love to sit with the mirrors and peck at them, be entertained by the reflection, much as parakeets and parrots do in captive cages. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so here's a, a question. Um, is the decoy or the sound more important? Or both? Or one or the other? Or it depends. I can give a try of that, but of course, Steve will, <laughs> will have more knowledge than me. I think the combination is a, is a great um, solution. And especially for nocturnal uh, species like uh, the junco or out of onshore water, basically, the, uh, the, the experts recommend use a sound system and uh, artificial net for nocturnal uh, species. And for dunal, they recommend the combination of sound systems and decoys and mirrors. So definitely, if we are able to have this combination of techniques, uh, depending on the species, that will be awesome for the, for the project. So I think both are important, but if we can, you can combine depending on the species, that would be better. I, I would agree with all of that. Yeah, for some species, um, you only need to have the, the uh, sound systems. Um, but uh, if you, but for daytime species, at least that are active at the islands or in the daytime, the multiple techniques probably are a good investment. Wonderful. Well, I've just I've just transferred myself to Chanyar. All I thought I was there the whole time, but it turns out I was just in my office spare bedroom. So sorry about that. But here I am on Chanyarol, which I was lucky enough to also visit. Any okay, let's see. Anyone else? Anyone on the call here have has anyone been to Chanyarol? I know I have. Karen has. Kote has. Who else? Anyone? All right, not a lot of people, but now oh wait, we got someone raising their oh Jose Jose Covello. Yes, he's yes, of course, yes. Our Chile team are all raising their hands. Well, one of the, one of the things I, I wanted to mention before we before we have you step away from this journey is that um, you know I've as much I've really enjoyed traveling with you all virtually, and you know how they say travel it's really a risk to start traveling with someone you don't even know or you've never met, and so I'm really glad that it turns out we're such good travel companions and that we can travel together. You know, no arguments so far; it's been fantastic. But um, when when hopefully. Uh, it is possible to travel together in real time. We can maybe test our compatibility as travel companions in real time. And there are going to be opportunities to go to many of the islands we did talk about on these journeys and maybe even others. So, um, you know, when, when that's possible, please look for um, us to be communicating with this island journey community about that and see if there's any interest. And then also I want to offer to Anyone who's attended all three island journeys on our system, email me and we will send you a little token of um, island conservation gratitude that you can wear proudly and help spread the word. So with that, with the, with the invitation to travel in real time and the invitation to keep traveling with us virtually if we do this again, I would say thank you so much to all of our presenters. We appreciate all of you. We appreciate all our uh, attendees. We have board members attending. We have partners. We couldn't do this work without any of you. Thank you. I know many of you are joining um, from Team Desicheo, uh, Team Chanyaral, Team Charles. So thank you to all of you who have helped to make this work possible. Thanks to the many island conservation colleagues I see your nice uh, faces on the screen. It's been lovely traveling with all of you around the world. So thank you to everyone. I wish you all really good health and uh, hang in there, take care of yourselves and let's keep traveling virtually and then see each other all in the real world on a, maybe a beautiful cliff like this someday when we can. So take care and goodbye. <laughs>